Welcome to today's Federalist Society virtual event. This afternoon, September 14th, 2022, we are discussing threats to Taiwan and the question, where does law matter? My name is Jack Capizzi, and I'm an assistant director of practice groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. After our speakers give their remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions. If you have a question, please just enter it into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, um, and we will handle those questions as we can towards the end of the program. And with that, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, Jeremy, I'll turn it over to you. Hi. Uh, I'm Jeremy Rapkin from the uh, Scalia School at George Mason University. Uh, I'm just the host, really, to pitch a few questions and get the discussion going. I won't go into any detail about the um, extensive credentials of our panelists, but just a few facts about each to just help you situate who's talking. Um, Julian Ku is a professor at the uh, Hofstra Law School uh, and, and a graduate of the Yale Law School. Uh, Mary Kissel used to be on the Wall Street Journal editorial board and was a senior advisor to Secretary Pompeo in the State Department. Uh, Michael Moza is at the American Enterprise Institute um, and has written extensively about U.S. defense policy in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, in fact, all of the panelists have written extensively about um, the issues that we're going to talk about today. Uh, and they all have considerable direct experience or at least um, regional experience. Um, Mike Maza uh, studied Chinese in Beijing. Uh, Mary lived in Hong Kong for a while. Julian was in Taiwan just a few years ago, right? For a year on sabbatical. So they all have experience in region and opinions about this and have been following it closely, so you won't just get them spouting. Uh, but we do want to talk about the legal issues for a legal, predominantly legal audience and try to get some perspective on whether the arguments of lawyers and law professors will matter very much in this, maybe not. Um, so I want to start with Julian, uh, the UN Charter seems on the one hand to uh, prohibit aggression, but on the other hand to um, authorize a right of self-defense to member states. And the obvious question here is um, if most countries in the world don't recognize Taiwan as an independent state, it's not a member of the UN, would a Chinese attack on Taiwan be in the terms of the UN charter aggression? And would Taiwan have the usual rights that we associate with a country at war defending itself? Um, you have some analysis of that that could get us started. Okay. So let me start. Yes, this is a this is a good example of why the question you raised. And thanks, Jeremy, and, and thanks to Fed Society for hosting this conversation. Um, this is a good example of where the law might matter. Um, and the question you raised. Um, lawyers like to think we matter. We matter less, perhaps, than we think. But here's an interesting example for Taiwan and international law in particular. As you point out, um, international law sets these rules. Uh, the most important of which is that. Uh, uh, you can't invade other states. <laughs> you can't commit aggression against other states. Now, sometimes states break this rule, see Russia and Ukraine, <laughs> but they're condemned for it, at least by most countries. Um, and it's, you know, I think, uh, so this is an important rule. And Taiwan is in a weird situation because, as you mentioned, Jeremy, uh, Taiwan is not a member of the United Nations. Uh, Taiwan is not recognized by most countries as a separate state. Um, and therefore, those two features um, make it possible for China, the People's Republic of China, to argue legally and politically that Taiwan, therefore, uh, does would not have any rights uh, to um, defend itself pursuant to the UN Charter, or at least legally defend itself. And why this matters is because um, China's view of Taiwan is that it's part of China. And so if China use force to invade Taiwan, it would not violate the UN Charter in, Ta in China's view because Taiwan's part of China. It would just be uh, occupying part of its own territory, just like the United States sent troops to 
put down a rebellion in Hawaii, I guess. I don't know what the right analogy is. Puerto Rico? <laughs> um, and, and, so, um, and, and, and so that would be the normal, um, and that's the view of the Chinese government. And, what's, and I think they would find some support in that from international law because of Taiwan's lack of legal status. So here, where Taiwan is not a member of the UN and doesn't have recognition from other states, it's a real problem for Taiwan. It's a real dangerous one because while states might choose to help Taiwan, support Taiwan, uh, a lot of states might choose not to. And because on the argument that, well, it's not a state and unlike Ukraine, there's no one, you know, we're not really sure what it is. And so this is why I think it is kind of really important um, for uh, the United States to take this legal problem seriously. Now, having said that, historically, the United States doesn't worry too much about this. So we will defend countries, we'll invade countries if we think it's the right thing to do for US interests and maybe moral interests. But the UN Charter hasn't always acted as constraint. I would say, though, I think it would be a, it is a huge problem for Taiwan in the event of a Taiwan crisis where China invaded, because it would be very difficult or more difficult for the United States and for Taiwan to rally international support to get the kind of support Ukraine's getting in terms of just arms, military support, but to get economic support to to or even get political condemnation. Now, maybe. Um, I'm glad that we have Mike and uh, Mary here, maybe to give a perspective. But that is what I worry about. And I think this is a problem. And just to sort of explain, uh, Mike has written about this in much more detail, but Taiwan is not a member of the United Nations because it is, uh, the, it is the remnants of the exiled Republic of China, which lost the Civil War in 1949 and has been in Taiwan ever since and, until, and has technically claimed to be a separate government. Um, uh, but it claimed that it's still the remnant of the government that used to control all of China. And so in that civil war scenario, there are two governments, but one state. Um, and in that situation, the UN says, well, we're going to recognize this government. There's only one state called China. <laughs> there are two governments. We now choose China as the People's Republic of China, the communist government, as the government that will represent China. Um, but we won't recognize Taiwan because it is no longer a representative of all of China. What's new and what's difficult is that there's a sense of Taiwan should be something on its own, kind of like its own country, even if it's called the Republic of China. But that legal argument has not really gotten much sway with, with anyone, including the United States. And the last question might be, why does the United States not recognize Taiwan? Because that's the deal we made. When we agreed to recognize China as the Republic of China, I mean, China, the People's Republic of China, Communist China, as the legitimate government of China, we agreed not to take sides on what the status of Taiwan was. We agreed to leave it ambiguous and not um, maintain relations with Taiwan. And so part of the reason we're in this situation is that the decisions the United States made in the 70s to make a deal with communist China um, to open relations with them, but also to, uh, to kind of cut back our relations with Taiwan. Um, and so we're living with the consequences of that deal now, which still might be the right deal to make. Nixon going to China seems like the right deal to make. But the cost, one of the costs was that we had to give up our formal diplomatic relations and I think damage some of Taiwan's international standing. Let, let me start with Mary. Um, if, uh, if there is a confrontation over Taiwan, there are threats to Taiwan, there are demands against Taiwan, and Taiwan starts to make the sort of pleas that we're now familiar with from Kiev, help us, help us send weapons. Um, I, I want to just focus first on the diplomatic side of this. Um, do we have good prospects of rallying at least our NATO allies or our closer allies in the uh, Western Pacific? Or do you think they would be a little bit intimidated by the legal situation that Julian just described? Well, first of all, th thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to be on this panel and I appreciate everyone who's watching. And secondly, I should say that I, I currently work at Stevens as uh, a senior policy advisor, so I don't want anyone to think that I'm unemployed. <laughs> um, uh, they are paying my bills. Um, from a uh, a, a U.S. point of view, while it's interesting um, to debate uh, the contours and the confines of international law, uh, ultimately, presidents tend to act in America's national interest. And as Julian pointed out, um, we have done so um, without uh, treaties or even um, declarations from Congress 
um, many, many times. So really the question of whether or not we would come to Taiwan's aid, I think, rests largely on a security and a, a political calculation. Um, we are not the only actors here, of course, and I would point uh, all of the viewers to the statements out of Tokyo of late, which has effectively declared Taiwan an almost existential threat uh, to the national security of Japan. And recall that we do have a defense treaty with Japan. So if Japan were to get into a conflict with uh, China vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, we, we may very well be pulled in in that fashion. Another important point, when we talk about the defense of Taiwan, I think it's often very comfortable for us to speak as if the United States has the sole responsibility to arm Taiwan. Now, as the world's largest superpower, of course, we have an outsized capability to do that. But so too does Taipei. And Taiwan could have taken steps, uh, whether it's developing an indigenous uh, defense industrial complex or um, making arrangements with other suppliers or putting more pressure on Washington to, to purchase weapons. Um, they've had a very, very closed economy, which has limited uh, their development and therefore the, the wealth that they have to go out and spend more money on defense. Um, but I just I wanted to make that clear because I when I hear these discussions, it's often only from our point of view, and there is an important responsibility there on Taipei's part. Yes, Jeremy, sorry. Just, just say a word about whether you think Europeans would follow us if we said we have to really commit to Taiwan. Well, we won't know until the moment. Did anyone, well, well, that, did anyone, did anyone, ad, well, did anyone anticipate that Germany would ultimately arm Ukraine? I think it's still a question whether Germany is going to arm as opposed to talking about arming. That's true. But by the same token, um, we are seeing some quite fundamental shifts in the behavior of nations that Britain would be more forward leaning than the United States and sending people to train in Ukraine. Um, and that's why I, I raised the question of Japan, because um, Japan's relationship, for instance, with Australia has really deepened. Um, over the last decade, bilateral defense treaty and um, exchanges. And that is in large part due to Chinese aggression. And it has a lot to do with China, China threatening Taiwan. Could you imagine in the midst of a crisis like this, in which, let's say, the United States is taking the lead in sending arms to Taiwan, uh, that the UN actually denounces that as outside intervention? And if such a thing were e either actually voted or anyway on foot, is your sense that the Europeans would be disturbed by that? Or would they say, we're, we're, we're past that? It doesn't matter anymore what the UN says. Well, China's on the Security Council. Yeah, but you could have a debate and you could take this to the General Assembly. I mean, China has bought the loyalties of. Yeah, and I'm, just, and I'm just asking whether you think that you mentioned Germany um, w would have the confidence to say, we don't care anymore what the UN says. We just support our friends. Well, no nation does things simply for support. They do it for their national interest. So that would be a calculation for Berlin if they think it's in their national interest. It is interesting that the SPD-led government in Berlin has started to talk about uh, reducing their dependence on China because of the lessons that they have learned in Ukraine. So there is a shift here going on. I'm not someone who would say that, you know, we're going to decouple from China and that will happen tomorrow. And Germany, of course, would support the United States. I think that's naive. Um, I've you know, heard plenty of folks go, uh, you know, say that in public. I, I just don't think it's workable. Um, but at some point, it may come a point here that if China decides to take a step like that, that nations will be faced with very difficult decisions. And there's no way to know until it happens. And also the leadership of those nations at that time matters because the, the political leadership and the political spine matters an enormous amount. And we know that China will increase its aggression until it's deterred. It's like they'll come and they'll punch you in the face. And if you take it, they'll punch you again. And that's how they operate. So it will, it will depend on many factors. But one thing is for sure, if Putin's aggression in Ukraine doesn't teach us a lesson, 
that we need to get serious about deterring Beijing, uh, then we're we're in, in effectively, I, 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 sad to say, I think, uh, inviting more aggression from that regime. And, and some of it already has been directed at EU member states, right? The Baltic states made some gestures toward Taiwan and China really hit back, not militarily, but with uh, economic threats. Um, I wonder which way that goes in Europe. Do they say uh, we, ha we have to guard against that or we have to avoid anything that will provoke that? We don't provoke aggression through deterrence. <laughs> By we, I was speaking in the voice of people thinking about this in Europe. Okay, so Mike Mazza, what, what countries would be most crucial for us to have on our side in a confrontation with China over Taiwan? It's the treaty allies. Um, you know, mo most important, you know, Mary has already pointed to is is Japan, which is obviously right next door, uh, dozens of miles away, and has a key national security interest in Taiwan's ongoing de facto independence. Um, you know, beyond Japan, I, I think Australia is enormously important, potentially Korea. Um, I, I think when it comes to the European allies, we don't expect too much when it comes to any sort of military contribution, but we'll take what we can get. Um, but, but you know, ec economic responses, as we've seen in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, I think are things that we will, will hopefully be counting on. Um, and, and ideally, we'll be talking about what those would look like ahead of time. So we're not flying by the seat of our pants should a, a crisis erupt. Could, could you just say a word about the actual treaty commitments that we have with the countries that you've named, particularly Japan and Australia and Korea? We have promised to defend them if they are attacked. We certainly have not promised to join them if they decide to come to the defense of a third party. So, and they don't promise to join us if we come to the defense of a third party, right? So you say the treaty partners, is it at all relevant that there are treaties there or is that just a, a sign of we're partners, forget about the content of the treaty? No, it, it's relevant for a couple of reasons and, and less so for due to legal obligations, you know, more so due to patterns of cooperation and the fact that you know, in important ways, our militaries are very deeply integrated. You know, we operate much of the same equipment. We know how to, to, to work together, to fight together. Um, and in the case of Australia, Japan, and Korea, you know, they're, they're right there in the region. Um, so even if they are not directly contributing to a fight, should a fight happen, uh, the United States is certainly going to be looking to depend on those countries to provide access to facilities and, and equipment. Um, so you know, when it comes to for the what's written in the treaties, I, I think that matters less here than the fact that we have you know decades long relationships in which we have fought together know how to fight together um and have important capabilities to bring to bear to, to solve this particular issue just w w while we're on this um that is the allies in the region it seems to me that um on the one hand they're much more focused on this because it's their neighborhoods. Of course, they care more about it. On the other hand, they're more threatened. So they might be a little more cautious than we might be or that we might like them to be. Just, I realize what Mary said is true. We won't know until we see how it plays out, but I mean, it's true also in military matters as in diplomatic. But is your sense that um, they are likely to be let's say, more forward-leaning about this and eager to do something or a little bit more reticent and really would need American prompting, which would be a kind of assurance that, yes, we're in this. You know, I think when you look at Japan and Australia in particular, uh, trends are moving towards, um, you know, I, I think trends indicate the United States can, can be increasingly confident that they're going to participate in some way. Um, you know, we, we've seen uh, increasing statements, as Mary has pointed out, out of Japan, suggesting that they're increasingly concerned about about the Taiwan Strait. Uh, in the case of all three of those allies, those particular allies, uh, Japan, South Korea and Australia, we've seen uh, public 
you know, joint presidential prime ministerial statements raising the question of peace in the Taiwan Strait. That's new and and different. And the fact that our allies are willing to publicly talk about that, um, again, is suggestive of where they're heading on. When, when, you know, when it comes to this question, um, Mary is obviously right that we won't know uh, how they'll react until they have to decide how to react. But I am more um, more confident that there will be some level of partnership than I would have been even three or four years ago. I, I teach a course on international law and I acknowledge what all the panelists here have said, which is the United States doesn't feel overly bound by it. I, I, I say that to my students, not in every class. Yeah. But, but Jeremy, uh, neither does China. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I'm fine. I, I wasn't even yeah. saying it as a criticism. I was just yeah. saying a lot of international law is sort of like suggested guidelines. There will be no necessary, it will not necessarily follow that you will pay a penalty. But uh, so I would like to shift now to thinking a little bit about um, American law, for which there sometimes are penalties. And even if there are not penalties uh, that are handed down by courts, uh, people take it more seriously because it's our law. So at least they take it more seriously in the United States. We have the Taiwan Relations Act, which was a substitute for the treaty with Taiwan that the Carter administration renounced. Let me just start with Julian, just to get, a, again, a little bit of a legal uh, setting for this. Um, and then I'm going to ask everybody, like, would it be helpful for us to make changes in the statutory framework of our relations with Taiwan? Um, Julian, just set the stage for us. The Taiwan Relations Act is not actually a treaty. It's, a, it's an act of Congress. Therefore, Congress could change it. Uh, help me with this. I mean, it, it has the same status as any other statute, right? Yeah, it's, it is a kind of unusual law, but you're right. It's an act of Congress. It was passed s essentially uh, in reaction to the Carter administration's um, pulling out of the U.S. with the U.S. Taiwan effectively defense treaty. So we we had a defense treaty that obligated us to defend Taiwan uh, like we do with Japan. And we abrogated that treaty and Congress really acting not necessarily with Carter administration support <laughs> passed the Taiwan Relations Act to try to stabilize Taiwan's relationship with the United States. It, it's not a mutual defense treaty. It does have certain obligations um, now, uh, which require the US to provide Taiwan with defense articles, um, or uh, weapons of a defensive character is the language they use. It does require uh, the US to um, act and to, to sort of, um, there's some technical things which allow um, Taiwanese, the Taiwanese government to continue to have relations with the United States on an unofficial basis. Um, as a legal nerd, you might know the Taiwan government gets sovereign immunity, <laughs> even though they're not a sovereign, but they're treated as if they were a sovereign. So there's a lot of little sort of things that are done to allow Taiwan to continue to work with the United States without officially being a government. And it's really been important to stabilize because I think it, it's a useful way. Look, it's not, no one's going to go to court to sue to enforce this law. Uh, the president, in theory, is bound by it, but is not, you know, the, the penalty is not like there's going to be litigation. Yes, but just just to be clear, um, it it doesn't obligate us to defend Taiwan. Right. It does not obligate us. It does obligate us to provide weapons of a defensive character and to and set sort of policy approaches. Well, and it and it also doesn't actually authorize the president in advance to take no yes. steps. Right. right. There's no, it's clearly written to avoid that question. So, <laughs> it does not so, authorize the president to take action to defend so, so Taiwan. I'll, I'll give you first bite at this quick. Um, would you like to see changes in that statute to make it more protective or even more stabilizing? Yeah, I mean, look, I think it's done a lot of good in sort of setting our policy. Um, you know, I, I I have two minds about this. I, they're actually currently considering the Taiwan Policy Act right now, actually, in Congress, which would try to update and reform the Taiwan Policy Act. I'm not sure, you know, there have been ideas, some members of Congress have proposed essentially a pre-authorization to pre-authorize uh, presidential action to defend Taiwan in the event of a crisis. Um, you know, I, I'm a little nervous about that <laughs> um, because uh, 
blank checks for the president make me nervous as a constitutional lawyer. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, I do think that it is important to clear away uh, ob legal obstacles to action by the president. And, and one thing that does worry me is that we will be in a Taiwan crisis and the president will be like, I got to go to Congress or do I have to go to Congress or what will Congress say? And then they won't act. Um, and so there is something, there's something um, to be said for pre, uh, giving the president more clear authority to act. Probably you'd have to phrase it and only in the event of actual use of force against Taiwan and only in defense of Taiwan, I don't think we can authorize offensive action against the PRC mainland <laughs> ahead of time. I'm just not ready to do that. Yeah. Even with me, like I'm nervous about China. I'm not ready to authorize war against China quite yet. So, so I think, but something like that would probably be more stabilizing given how scary China is right now. Uh, we, we, we'll get into this, I hope in the next round, but like, what do we mean by offensive action against Taiwan, which covers a lot of possibilities. But, but just for the moment, um, if I understood you, you're saying uh, the Taiwan Relations Act is enough. It's it's not enough. I mean, it's 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 good, but I think I think we can improve it. There are some things about it that aren't uh, don't bother me. Like the people are worried. The Taiwanese government is annoyed because they're not allowed to fly their flag and things like that. Um, I I don't really care that much about that. <laughs> like I think it's okay, but I get that they. If Those they, things are not if if they are threatened, their flag will be flying all over uh, the Twitter sphere. Yeah, you're right. That's that's true. Although they that's <laughs> yes, that's true. Although I'm not sure this okay. helps train as much as it would, but I, I think they prefer the weapons and maybe that's, the groups. That's, that's, Mary, are there things you would like to see enacted by Congress now? Well, I'm not a constitutional legal scholar, so I'll I'll have to uh defer to my esteemed uh, colleagues um, on the legal questions, but I think it is important to note the, uh, that the Constitution, of course, splits the power to wage war between uh, Congress and president as commander in chief. Um, and I tend to have an expansive view of executive power, um, probably from my Wall Street Journal editorial board days. Um, but um, you know, should we change how we um, uh, view Taiwan um, under the Taiwan Relations Act or the One China Policy per se? Um, I believe that it's extremely important for us to acknowledge the reality of the relationships that we have as a nation um, for several reasons. First of all, because you can't construct sound policy based on lies. And secondly, um, you can never start to um, uh, really convince the American people of a course of policy action without laying down arguments over long periods of time. And I think um, the Taiwan Relations Act and even Nixon you know, going to China and, and our support for kicking Taiwan out of the UN, that was you know, right at the time. Um, but I think times change. And uh, I believe that it's perfectly reasonable under the one China policy where we agree to disagree with Beijing to recognize the reality that Taiwan is an independent uh -huh. nation. So I, I wanted to just, as a talk show hosts say, let's make news. So you, your position is actually, we should recognize Taiwan as an independent state. Is it not? And I know I'm not sure that I'm senior enough or important enough to make news, but I appreciate the compliment, Jerry. Um, this has been said by many, many other uh, people, um, particularly my former boss, Secretary yes. Pompeo, and the former Defense Secretary, and and, uh, and, and uh, others far far more important than I am. But, but I took it I took it as news as a at least a um, implication that Secretary Pompeo might be willing to follow you. He already did it in Taipei saying we should recognize Taiwan. Yes, he's yeah. already said that. And, and look, I mean, again, I just want to go back to the more fundamental point because it, it doesn't necessarily only apply to Taiwan. Um, I, I think it's important for us to recognize um, the character of the communist regime in Beijing. I think it's important for us to recognize that Taiwan um, has never been run by the People's Republic of China. Um, and, and, and we need to be honest about that. Um, and, and then we need to construct policy that deters Beijing, because ultimately this entire discussion isn't about a, a conflict. It's about deterring conflict. In Nixon's words, right, we want to wage peace, not war. 
And so I tend to believe that the most important and effective way for us to wage peace um, is to see the world clearly and to incent and deter Beijing, uh, to deter Beijing from invading and to incent Taiwan um, to take steps to, to, to help itself and to arm itself. Mike, would um, other countries in the region subscribe to the Pompeo Doctrine? No, um, they may get there though. I, again, I think um, what, the kinds of things, the kinds of conversations we're seeing in Japan and Australia in particular are, are things we just wouldn't have seen even a few years ago. So I, you know, I, I think presented with that um, proposal today, it would be a resounding no. But but I also think that there is perhaps the possibility for a conversation where there wasn't before. So uh, I wouldn't say a lot of people, but some people in the West have been echoing the Putin line that Ukraine is not a real country because they just speak a dialect of Russian and they've always been part of Russia and never mind, it's just not a thing. I, I think there's fewer people saying that now with Ukrainian victories in the field and good for them. Um, is there any disposition in the Western Pacific to say, oh, really, Taiwan is just a part of China because they sort of speak Chinese and they eat a lot of the same food? I mean, does everyone take it as, of course, a elemental reality that it's a separate country, really? You know, I think the truth is probably somewhere in between and it varies country to country. Um, no, certainly. Again, I mean, not sound like a broken record here, but but Japan and Australia don't think of Taiwan as necessarily part of of China. Um, you know, I don't think South Korea looks at that as just an internal matter for for China. But I think you are more likely to hear that sort of argument in places like Indonesia, um, in in certainly places like Cambodia um, and and Laos, which at this point those two are you know essentially Chinese client states. Um, the Chinese propaganda information warfare here has been extremely effective in, in some countries in, in the Asia Pacific, um, but has fallen flat elsewhere. Uh, just one more question related to this. Um, do you think not even um, dip diplomatically, but thinking about an actual military response of some kind, uh, there are particular allies there that would be absolutely um, indispensable for us to act. Like we need to have ports for our fleet. And so we absolutely have to have them on board if we contemplate any kind of, even just a show of force. Or, or can we do this all on our own? I mean, I think it's pretty difficult to imagine doing this successfully um, without access to Japanese facilities in particular. Uh, it's just they're, they're right there. And um, without that access, we're going to be fighting from very long distances with, with long and potentially vulnerable supply chains. We're going to face that even, even with Japanese assistance, um, but it, it makes things a little bit easier. And would you say that also about Australia? I think it's less crucial. Um, but again, I, I do think we will expect to have, or certainly want to have access to Australian ports, especially if we want to be doing things um, to, uh, if we want to be doing things in the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean, then access to Australian facilities is important. Any other countries that we haven't ticked off yet, like Singapore? Well, the, isn't the Philippines the most important country here? The Philippines is, is certainly nearby. Yeah. So Philippines, yes, I, I leave it out because it's very unclear to me at this point where the Philippines is going on this, this question. Uh, and perhaps Mary has more, more insight. I don't know. Um, I think we would certainly like to have access to those facilities. Those facilities are less well developed. And, and, you know, we don't have significant forces there already. Um, but to the extent that we can can access the variety of, of air and naval bases that we we have negotiated to have access to in peacetime, that would obviously be a good thing. And, mm -hmm. and the Philippines has its own uh, territorial disputes with China, right? They're a little bit sensitive to China taking over islands. It, 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 it does. Um, um, but what we've seen from the past president 
and in, in, you know, this new president, I think we're still sort of feeling out is a tendency to seek positive relations with China in order to address that, you know, rather than um, a sort of a, a, an approach which leans heavily on its relationship with the United States um, and on international law, frankly, in order to push back against uh, Chinese encroaches. Okay. May I jump in real quick? Yeah. Um, I also think Mike Mike is also raising an important point here, which I think is the domestic political dynamics between it, within the democracies in Asia. And Duterte, the prior Filipino uh, president, uh, was very pro-China, but then they had the dispute over China's claims in the South China Sea, which were clearly ludicrous and um, were rejected by the Permanent Court, Court of Arbitration in The Hague back in, what, 2016, I think. Um, and so they're too and changed. And, you know, uh, much will depend if this conflict is started by Beijing on how it is done. Um, one might imagine that Beijing might attack Guam. Guam is a U.S. territory. That's U.S. soil. Now, that would be an attack on the United States uh, were that to happen. That could completely change the nature of such a, a, a conflict here. Um, uh, what would happen if shipping lanes were cut off and suddenly Jakarta saw um, their freedom of movement on the seas severely restricted. How would India react? Recall India just had a, a very violent set of clashes only two years ago on their border with China. And there's no love lost now between India and China, if there ever were any to begin with. Um, but that's deeply seated now. And it's a very strong uh, domestic political pressure um, on New Delhi. Uh, so there are just many factors here that go beyond just military capabilities and the confines of international law. Yeah, good. It sets us up for the last round of questions I wanted to pursue. Um, suppose China does threaten uh, sea lanes, which which people think they have been building a navy in order to do. Uh, Julian, the president, do you think, can he plausibly uh, deploy the U.S. Navy on his own say-so to protect sea lanes? And I, I'm asking you both for legal analysis, not just your view, but what it's a like plausible range of views on this. Uh, and also just as a starting point, whether you think that debate would matter much if the president decided I'm doing it and just sent out yeah, the so, um, Yeah, so let me play lawyer here. The, probably the, the prevailing opinion is, uh, uh, with respect to the blockade, I think the blockade scenario is very likely. We saw China's recent military exercises are kind of like a proto blockade to show they could blockade Taiwan if they wanted to, and they could. Um, so the legal question would be, could the U.S. Navy under the president's own authority take action to break a blockade? Um, and I think the answer is uh, without Congress, without going to Congress for separate authorization. Yes. And I think the, the range of opinions is... Um, is mostly no, right? Under from legal scholars, um, the but and the reason for this is the precedents for such an action aren't really there. Um, the uh, the precedents for a U.S. action President, President Reagan against Libya in 1980. Right. So the precedents for unilateral presidential actions have generally been um, air actions against um, land targets. Um, they have not been, and they've been for narrow uh, narrow purposes. So. Kosovo and uh, Libya um, in 2011. Um, and in Libya in 2011, the uh, Department of Justice actually, well, not Department of Justice, the State Department said, well, because they can't shoot back because we're too far away, because we're shooting from offshore, that's not a conflict. And so we're okay. So there have been attempts, so the, 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 not, the unilateral presidential actions have not, as to my mind, have not ever extended to naval actions against another uh, country's no, I mean, naval forces. No, um, I mean, there is this famous episode where uh, Gaddafi said the Gulf of Serta belongs to Libya. If you look at a map, it's hundreds of miles across. And President yeah. Putin said, I contest that. <laughs> and he sent the Navy and basically said, try to exclude us. And insanely, right. they tried. And then the Navy so, sent the, yeah. the uh, Libyan patrol boats. And everybody said... That was good. Uh, there was, like, it was, but but I think that I think that that would be interesting. I think the difficult thing would be a shooting war. So I guess the U.S. It, it, the, the little details <laughs> that matter. That was a shooting war. You just well, say so they're right. Libyan bullets, so they don't matter. Well, they didn't really injure anyone. I mean, like imagine. I think if the U.S. Navy went in with like a uh, like um, they were leading like a, a 
um, a convoy. They're convoying, and they and they said, "Look, shoot at us. We're not going to shoot at you. Yes. He can do that." Yes. Um, and but I think if he launches offensive actions um, without sort of you know uh, without that that actually makes a difference. Like I think a lot of the legal opinions coming out of Department of Justice emphasize the difference between offensive versus defensive actions. So I think uh, it's a close call, but I think that would be it would be a difficult case to go after. Uh, to, legally to justify a unilateral presidential action to attack Chinese naval forces. It was, it was a little bit before your time and even before my time, but President Roosevelt did this very extensively in 1940 and 1941, right? Right. There are a lot of people who agree that was going to be attacked. Yes. Now, he would say, you can attack us. He didn't, you know, it was, a, they were there convoying, tr- you know, to, to England. That probably is the best example, right? And and at the culmination of this, he ordered the Navy, if you see a, a U-boat, right. sink on sight. Right. But that, yes, he did. And that, that was one of the reasons why Republicans at the time condemned him as <laughs> acting illegally, but. But not afterwards. Uh, well, yeah, fair enough. Now, I will say the one thing that worries me here is that, um, the most effective response to China would be to threaten it with offensive action. So the missile bases on the mainland are the main threat here because they don't even have, they could they could blockade by just threatening to use their land-based missiles. And so the US, I think clearly the one line we can draw is offensive action against the Chinese mainland. I don't think the president can do that without Congress, both legally and politically. I don't think any president I can imagine, even <laughs> some of our recent presidents, could feel comfortable going if, uh, of opening an action against the Chinese mainland without any sort of congressional authorization, um, even though that would militarily, I'm told, be more effective. In other words, you want to knock out their missile bases and their air forces first, and that will allow then you to be able to protect Taiwan better. But and that will allow the U.S. aircraft carriers to move in. And so there are lots of things you could do that would make sense militarily, but which I think are legally and politically uh, not possible. And the general line is between offensive actions, which are not you know, predicated on responding to an action against U.S. territory. Can I, can I jump in here? Yeah. Yes, I, I wanted to ask you, when you jump in, just to respond to this point that Julian has made, which is that um, we it might be dangerous for, for us to try to protect uh, merchant shipping if we had not taken out Chinese uh, air capacity, a capacity to attack it from bases on its mainland. Do you agree with that? Then you can say anything. Yeah. Um, yes, that, I mean, that's, that's probably accurate, right? So China can project an enormous amount of force from, um, you know, from capabilities it has on the mainland, both into the air and to the sea. And so if we are uh, avoiding those targets in a, you know, military conflict, then we're uh, you know, we're putting ourselves at a, at a disadvantage in, in important ways. Um, the, the point I wanted to make is, I mean, I, I agree with, I think what, what Julian has sort of been getting at over the course of this conversation, which is that um, we need to think about ways to make it easier for the president to react quickly in the event of a, of a you know, conflict or crisis, right? That that improves our deterrent position vis-a-vis China. And again, I, I agree with that. But I also think we should be careful not to think of congressional authorization as a roadblock exclusively. Because congressional authorization, if the Chinese believe that it's likely, actually significantly en- enhances our, you know, our deterrent effect. Right. And so this gets at something that that Mary brought up earlier, which is the US president um, should be regularly, consistently making the case to the American people about U.S. interest in the Taiwan Strait, why Taiwan's independence is a is a key national interest of the United States. So, you know, when when the time comes, if it ever, you know, God forbid, comes, you know, U.S. president and his counterpart in Beijing can be confident he'll have that congressional authorization. Right? That that that's enormously more powerful as a deterrent, I think, than. Um, than a president having to go it alone, right? Than having China think about what the political situation in, in the United States might be, right? So, you know, and presidents haven't been doing this for a long time. And, and I think that we have uh, failed to do that to our, our great detriment. Also, just from a political calculation here in the United States, 
Recall that President Obama didn't get involved in the war on ISIS until you had Americans beheaded on video camera and streamed across the United States. If, if we had a, a conflict erupt between China and Taiwan, there are thousands of dual nationals, American citizens who are living and working in both countries um, and could potentially be caught up in that. I mean, we, we would be personally affected. I'm not saying that that's a reason why we would intervene. I think if we intervened, it would be because we see it as the first island chain and key to the defense and our, right, our, our um, ability uh, to protect the Pacific and those key shipping lanes. And if you let the first island chain go, then what comes next? Um, you know, you have that argument of the domino theory, but just to make the point that, you know, to Michael, that, that to Michael's point, there are just so many other um, issues that the president would need to consider here. And domestic politics will also matter. One, one, of, one, of, one of the questions that uh, viewers have sent in is, uh, should we think of uh, Taiwan mostly as a liability that we've talked about them for a long time as if they were independent, so it'd be embarrassing to let them go, or you're now saying it's a domino in a series, but the questioner asks, should we think of it as a strategic island close to China, which is helpful to hold for a coalition that is, let's say, an anti-China coalition? Like I think I think the United States has multiple interests when it comes to its relationship with Taiwan. And so we can think of that in sort of your your classic, you know, geostrategic terms, right? It's it's the unsinkable aircraft carrier as as MacArthur called yeah. it. Now we can think about the economic importance, right? It's a small country, 23, 24 million people, but it's a top 10 trading partner. You know, everybody's talking about semi semiconductors now. Um but even beyond semiconductors, it's it's long been an important U.S. partner, and you know has a, an important position in in global supply chains. And you know, if you you focus on things like uh, human rights, democracy, you know, uh, what we can consider to be universal values, um, then Taiwan's survival as a thriving democratic state is is important. So um, you're going to sort of pick what what argument you like best. Um, but there's a there, there's something that can that can appeal to just about anybody. Yeah, I, I would just say quickly. I um I think that the, I think the political mobilization within the U.S. is really important, and Congress is actually very friendly toward Taiwan. Usually more friendly, frankly, than the State Department <laughs> in many cases. In other words, that they are you know, and so and you know, but and so I think that but building that political argument, making the argument, and Congress can reflect that political consensus through statutes and through things like the Taiwan Relations Act and maybe uh, updates to it. So that can be helpful and really helpful. The one thing that worries me though, is uh, I, I'm, when I've had conversations, which are very few with folks in China, when I have them recently, um, I try to make this point that you don't wanna mess with America when Congress and the president are on the same page, right? It's, you don't, don't mess with us, especially when that happens. But I'm not sure people in China uh, that the scholars I've talked to recently are, are are deterred by that. They're like, well, yeah, we kind of assume that everyone's on board with that. And so I, I, it does worry me that I don't know how much more deterrence we can get. But I'd still like to make sure that we do everything we can to deter China as much as possible. This is uh, another question that was sent in by a viewer uh, uh, that follows directly from what you said. Um, question is... Um, putting aside military threats or military actions, what kind of threats could we make to deter China that they would take seriously in Beijing? Could we substantially cut off uh, energy supplies, uh, limit their exports? Are, are there threats that we could make that they would take seriously? That's for anyone who has an opinion about it. I don't think it's about threats. I think it's about the actions that we take. They don't really look at what they say. We say only they look at what we do. Yes, but and we would like, we would like we would like to deter them from threatening Taiwan, and deterrence aims to prevent something from happening. So it's in advance of their doing it. So I'm not sure we would do a lot before they 
do something, right? So we want to put on the table, if you do this, we can do that. Deterrence is will plus capacity. So the first thing we can do is speak honestly about Taiwan and what it is, which is to my earlier remarks. And the second is we can increase military capacity. Um, uh, we, no, but I, so, but I mean, could, could we, let, let's, let's just talk about Chinese exports. Um, a lot of them go to the United States. We, we almost certainly could live without almost all of them. Um, a lot of them go to other countries that may say, no, thank you. We don't want to really get involved in that. So we might have difficulty organizing economic sanctions that would bite. China's Achilles heel is its energy, the lack of energy. Oh, fine. So, so, so the energy. Um, could we really stop... Uh, countries in the Middle East from sending oil to China. Well, that's why we need to incent places like Saudi Arabia and the Gulf nations and to, to our side, because they are straddling um, the United States and China. It's why we need to um, exert uh, an enormous amount of additional pressure on the Islamic Republic of Iran, which is an energy producer and, and a significant exporter um, to, to China which we are not doing. I, I think it, it, one of the mistakes we that we have often, been doing too well with um, sanctions on Iran. Well, but, you know, Professor, I think you raise an important point that we tend to think of these issues as solely bilateral problems, but they're not because that's not how the world works. So we saw this very clearly um, with the announcement of the No Limits Partnership between Russia and China. We see it very clearly um, with Iran arming um, Putin for his invasion of Ukraine, right? When we talk about Taiwan and China, um, things that we do in uh, other uh, geographies matters. So how do you deter China? Well, you arm Ukraine so that they can win quickly instead of letting this drag out for you know, months on end with thousands of lives lost. You actually impose a serious set of sanctions on Russia to cripple its economy. You pressure India into helping us do that um, it's not just about the specific statues or what Congress says that we can or cannot do vis-a-vis -vis Taipei. It's, it's, it's a much more complex question. And I, I just think that's important for viewers to think about when we're thinking about how do we, how do we wage peace in Asia Pacific? How do we deter China? I, I, I totally understand the argument that you're making and I am very sympathetic to it. I would like to draw on your experience of the last few years. Um, do you think it makes it easier to bring other countries along with us if we openly acknowledge, yes, you'll be helping Ukraine in your neighborhood, but it's not just about that. It's about our geo strategy in the Western Pacific, which maybe even Olaf Schultz doesn't care that much about and gets a little bit rattled if we bring that up while discussing Ukraine. I think we have to be honest about who our reliable partners actually are in Europe and Asia, and that changes over time. Um, and I, I don't think that, uh, you know, if, if you talk to our, our partners behind closed doors, um, they will frankly acknowledge, even the French, we need American leadership. It's very important. Uh, it's important, too, to give them political top cover within their own nations to deal with their own domestic political constituencies. But we have ready and willing partners. Um, look at the new you know, Liz Truss government in the UK. They're, in some respects, they're more forward leaning than we are. Well, also uh, in Ukraine. Uh, particularly on Ukraine. And that's excellent. But it's also important to note there is deep bipartisan consensus on the threats that we face from communist China, from the Islamic Republic of Iran from um, Putin's regime in Russia and uh, on Capitol Hill. And that was unthinkable even a few years ago. I think that's a really important development because ultimately national security should not be a partisan issue. It's an American issue. Yes. And I think that's an excellent, excellent development. Yes, although one might say it's a sign that actually the situation is deteriorating. So everyone now recognizes that <laughs> the threat is greater and we're not really up to it. So I would like just, we have just a few minutes left to ask each of you to just summarize um, how anxious you are. I mean, would you say the threat level is, I don't remember the color scheme that we used to have for this, but you know, we should all be concerned, actively concerned, 
anxious, very, very disturbed, or full on panicked. Take your choice. You want to start, Mary? You know, speaking about the threat to Taiwan. I, I wouldn't say that I'm panicked, but I'm probably far more concerned about a potential Chinese action than most analysts are, simply because I think American deterrence has been severely eroded over the last couple of years. And um, so I'm not panicked, but I'm deeply concerned. Yeah, we do not look very serious viewed from outside, right? O only we know that we're really serious about getting to the bottom of the Mar-a-Lago stolen papers, whatever they are. I didn't expect you to say anything about that, <laughs> Julian. Um, all right, so, you know, I, I'm i actually, uh, at moments, especially during the exercise, I was kind of close to panic. I'm, I'm very easily panicked. But, um, <laughs> well, I, 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 then I talked to my relatives in Taiwan who are never panicked. And it, they annoy me because they're never panicked. I'm like, you should be panicking, right? Um, but, but, and the reason they're not panicked is because they've seen this before. But I think for me, I, I'm kind of, you know, I take it very seriously. I, I, I do think the Chinese government is much more dangerous than sometimes we acknowledge on this issue. Um, and their actions in Hong Kong gave them kind of a, like a cheap and easy victory. Now it costs them in terms of Taiwan, people in not Taiwan are more afraid of them, but I really do worry that's what will, that, what, that something like Hong Kong could happen to Taiwan. And it worked for them on Hong Kong. The Chinese government has, I think can say it's a success for them. Um, and that worries me that they're going to be tempted to try to pull something similar with Taiwan. And it'll be harder to do, but the, the temptation to get some sort of peaceful, costless, bloodless victory in Taiwan, like they did in Hong Kong, um, is something that I think worries me. And uh, uh, and that's why I'm, I'm maybe on the, not on the edge of panic, but getting toward the edge of panic, I guess. I, I think it's good to bring up Hong Kong because there, there was a legal commitment by China not to do that, to do what they did. Right. To just completely swallow it up and say, now it's Chinese and we do whatever we want. And the world's reaction to China's um, basically uh, tearing right. up that commitment what was um, pretty insouciant. Right. I mean, there were a few speeches, a few people said tisk tisk, but really there was the world said it's your country. Even it's if not it's just the world. I mean, just like, you know, like American companies. Or, you know, we're still everything's still kind of normal. And I think. That worries me. I can imagine, you know, a world where after a Taiwan invasion scenario, you know, all the banks get back to business and like things go back to normal, kind of like they have in Hong Kong. And that, you know, that seems like that 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 that, that part panics me because I see what happened in Hong Kong. And the world can live with a, what what to me seemed inconceivable when I was living in Hong Kong. Um, a communist dominated Hong Kong seemed to be inconceivable. Now we just assume it's oh that's normal, <laughs> um, and that's what worries me about a future for Taiwan. Yes. So, Mike Maza, you are putting your hopes on Japan, a country which can be unleashed to take back Sakhalin and divert the Russian from Ukraine. Uh, no, I never put your hope in Japan. Um, look, I, I, I too am I'm very concerned. I, I think I think we're we're going to find out in the not too distant future what what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. I, I think I think peaceful unification is is not in the in the cards in any you know conceivable time frame. Right? Taiwan has has no appetite, and things are only moving in the opposite direction. I think uh, unification, annexation of Taiwan, is only becoming more important to Xi Jinping. Right? He, he's made it clear this is central to sort of his animating vision. And this happens at a time when when the PLA is is becoming increasingly capable, when the balance of military power across the strait continues to deteriorate, and at a time when, you know, now I think the, the Biden administration at times, in particular the president, talks a big game, but there is no urgency when it comes to our own defense spending and, and other and, or our diplomacy to match the sort of the rhetorical urgency that the administration has adopted when it comes to Taiwan. And you think the time frame for like when we need to be most anxious is probably within the, the life of the Biden administration, like the next three years, next two years? No, I, well, I wouldn't be shocked, but no, I mean, I, I like to think of this as a sort of a 10-year problem. Ah. 
Um, I w- wouldn't be surprised if we face something, a crisis a little sooner. If it's 15 years from now, that won't shock me either. But I think this is not some some distant, far off proposition at this point. Well, it makes a difference if this comes to a head when Tony Blinken is our, um, you know, valiant spokesman or in the succeeding uh, Pompeo administration when Mary Kissel is the voice speaking for us. It does. It does. Okay, well, good luck to Taiwan. (laughs) Good luck to Japan, to Australia, to all our allies and friends. And especially to the United States. And uh, I also want to thank the Federal Society for sponsoring this event. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you. All right, yes. Uh, Well, yes, on behalf of the Federal Society, thank you all for participating. Um, You can give us listener feedback if you want at info at fedsoc.org. And yes, that's all for today. So we are adjourned.